In late January of 1942, the Japanese advance down the Malayan Peninsula was seemingly unstoppable. Despite spirited defence, the Allied soldiers were suffering defeat after defeat as the Japanese pushed forward. After the heavy defeat around Bakri and Moor, the Australian and Indian soldiers of the shattered 45th Brigade fought their way towards the Parit Salong Bridge, the only means of escape for the formation. Forward scouts reported that the bridge was in Japanese hands. The guards from the 6 Norfolks had been driven off and the important crossing points had been captured. On the 21st of January, the 45th Brigade, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Anderson, arrived at the Parit Sulong Bridge. An English-speaking Malayan informed Anderson that the bridge was held by the Johor military forces and led them forward with an escort. However, these men were being led into an ambush and found an emplaced Japanese machine gun post to the position, which wounded several of the party. The brigade then attempted to force passage through the bridge, but fighting raged all day and Japanese tanks, aircraft and artillery caused heavy casualties on the brigade. Later that morning, a message was received that a relief force from Yongpeng was heading out to help the breakout. Whilst the fighting on the bridge escalated, the rear of 45th's column was repeatedly assaulted by infantry and tanks. Two soldiers managed to disable a Japanese tank using grenades and formed a roadblock, where more tanks were knocked out with the use of grenades and boys' anti-tank rifles in grim fighting. The forward elements of the column had been forced into an area of roadway about 400 metres wide. Anderson requested of General Gordon Bennett that an airstrike could be conducted on the Japanese defences of the bridge in the morning, along with an airdrop of supplies and morphine for the wounded. He received the reply, look up at Sparrowfart. In the evening of the 21st, the dead and wounded were piling up, and Anderson requested of the Japanese that two fully laden ambulances would be allowed to pass under the bridge and onto the Allied lines. The Japanese refused, and ordered the ambulances to remain in the road as a roadblock. The Japanese also called for the Allies' surrender, saying the wounded would be treated fairly. Anderson was still under the impression that help would be coming from the Yongpeng direction, and refused to surrender. The Japanese threatened to shoot the ambulances if they were moved, but Lieutenant Austin and another driver slipped the brakes of the ambulances, letting them roll silently back down the road. Under the cover of gunfire, they started the engines and then drove back to the 45th Brigade's positions. In the morning, RAF aircraft arrived, they dropped supplies on the brigade, and then started bombing the Japanese positions on the far side of the bridge. However, enemy tanks began their attacks on the 45th Brigade flanks, reducing the footing even more. Anderson probed the Japanese defences once again, thinking that the aerial attacks may have weakened them. Unfortunately, nothing had changed. Bennett sent another message telling Anderson good luck and that there was no hope of relief. The 45th were to withdraw the best they could. At 9am, the guns and heavy equipment were destroyed and the remains of the brigade began to withdraw east through the jungles towards Yongpeng. 150 wounded men were left behind, tended by volunteers. Of 4,000 men in the brigade, eventually around 500 Australians and 400 Indians actually made it through to Allied lines. The wounded, who had remained behind, were mistreated by the Japanese captors before they were then executed. The prisoners were beaten and forced into two small buildings on the side of the road, where the men were packed in so tight they were piled on top of one another. They were denied drinking water, and the Japanese soldiers brought buckets full of water, only to pour them on the ground just out of reach. The prisoners were then tied up in groups, pushed into the roadside scrub and machine gunned. Petrol was then poured on the bodies, some of whom were still alive, and they were burnt in an attempt to cover the scene of the war crime. 145 men were killed during this massacre, with many of the Indian soldiers being beheaded. One of the survivors was Lieutenant Ben Hackney of the 2nd 29th Australian Battalion, who managed to crawl away with two others, Sergeant Ron Croft and an English soldier, both of whom died over the next two days. Hackney managed to stay undetected for 36 days until a party of Malay discovered him. One of them, a police officer, turned him over to the Japanese at Parit Sulong. The Japanese then beat him. Hackney, however, survived the war and was able to testify about the massacre, and in the war crimes court in 1950, General Takuma Nishimura was sentenced to death for his part in ordering the massacre at Parit Sulong. Hackney was one of only two Europeans to survive. On the 23rd of January, the final act of fighting took place. Two companies of the 2nd Loyals covered the retreating column of the 45th Brigade and were attacked by seven tanks and two battalions worth of Japanese infantry. The Japanese infantry attempted to dismantle the roadblocks created by the Loyals and took heavy casualties as they did. But with no anti-tank weapons and vastly outnumbered, the Loyals eventually had to fall back. The fighting at Parit Salong was the end of the long period of fighting around Moir and Bakri. 45th Brigade had all but ceased to exist and despite local success, the Japanese advance had only slowed and not been stopped.
General Percival blamed the inexperienced Indian troops, but they were facing the Japanese Imperial Guards and they put up a stout defence against overwhelming odds. Arguably, 53rd Brigade were thrown into the front lines too quickly, having spent three months at sea in troop ships and they were sent to their positions after only three days of arrival. Anderson was awarded the Victoria Cross in his part for holding the Japanese Imperial Guard at bay for four days, and the Japanese concluded that the fighting around Muir was the hardest they encountered during the campaign, and it showed that the Allies could give as good as they got. However good the defences had been in places, it was clear that the Allies could no longer hold on to Johor and plans were made to evacuate to Singapore Island.